Well, hello everyone, right on time here. Uh, just commenting earlier to Molly about what a beautiful day it is. I hope it's beautiful wherever you all are as well. Um, yeah, I was also just saying though that I just read an article about how seasonal affective disorder might not be real, but it feels real. So <laughs> uh, I've definitely been feeling much better with, with the sun. I hope that's the case for you as well. And that your quarters are wrapping up well. I can't believe that this is our last week of classes, right? So this is our last meeting today. Um, and uh, next week is just finals week, which for us just means time for you to work on last minute revisions, right, before we submit our final drafts. Uh, please make those revisions, right? A lot of you have been. Um, I've seen a drastic improvement over the last couple weeks in the drafts, just people catching up on, you know, uh, older feedback and things like that. So they're looking really good. So keep up with that. Um, yeah, making sure that what we turn in for the final draft is not the same thing that we turned in for the rough draft, right? That we've incorporated at least a few more improvements in there. Um, there are, uh, you know, other things to talk about today as well. If some of you are interested in taking other philosophy classes down the road, there's also some really great um, summer programs available for philosophy that are trying to aim to diversify the discipline a little bit more. So, um, you know, I can talk to you guys about some things like that. Um, but I also have a meeting after class with a few students, so even though I'm, I will still be happy to stick around, uh, just know it may be a little bit longer wait than usual as I have a few people uh, booked. Um, so let's start with any questions about the end of the quarter, end of the class. Um, you got an announcement recently about, you know, a reminder of how to make up extra points, right, with the regular policy as well as an extra credit opportunity. So uh, just general questions about the class in the end of the quarter here. No? All right, I'm gonna assume then that everything is just really clear and understandable, which I hope I hope that is the case, good. All right, so um, before we dive in, I just wanted to say a few words since this is the last class and given that we tend to get deep into conversation, I wanna say these things now because we'll probably not have time at the end. Um, so, it's been hard for me to really enjoy teaching as much as I used to since the pandemic. Uh, being in the classroom was definitely my favorite part of the job. Um, and this is the first quarter since the pandemic that I have been able to have a hybrid class like this. Um, it's just students don't seem to want to enroll in classes like this in their electives, right? They save, you know, the time commitments for uh, their more important classes or something. I don't know. But um, so it was just really wonderful to get uh, excited about my job again this quarter. And so I really want to thank you guys all for that. You've been such wonderful students and participants, and I really appreciate you attending every week um, or when you can, uh, especially since I didn't make it required. So I just wanted to uh, thank you all and let you know that uh, the conversations that we've been having in class have prompted me or at least gone along with some other interests that I've been having for a long time. And I have since been motivated to apply to a PhD program to write my dissertation on some of those ideas. So again, I just want to thank you guys because I again, it's been too long since I've been excited about my job and about academia. And so I just want to give you all credit for that. So thank you. <laughs> And uh, now I will uh, leave it for us to discuss um, the newer religions, right? So we have uh, the newer religions that we looked at last week, but also we're looking at individualized spirituality this week as well, right? Um, leaving institutions and whatnot uh, to, you know, as a result of the feminist critiques, right, that we've seen throughout the quarter. Um, this can also be a time for us to review anything about the previous religious traditions we've looked at. I know we don't have a final exam in this class, but, um, you know, I, I don't want you to think that the stuff we talked about at the beginning of the quarter is any less important than what we're talking about now. So uh, feel free to ask any wrap up questions as well, but I'll just I'll leave the class open to questions. So if you want to raise your hand, um, Anita, absolutely. I've uh, got a message from you to meet after class. I'm happy to. I've got two people ahead of you. So as long as you don't mind waiting. Um, so questions about either this week's content, last week's newer religious traditions and mixtures, or other traditions that we've looked at throughout the quarter. And I'll give people a second to type in the chat if that's where they'd like to submit their questions. 
can also raise your hand. But surely you guys have some questions come up this group. You guys are highlighting something really important, and it makes me want to draw attention to a bonus question that I added to this week's discussion. Um, and I made it a bonus question because I don't want you to have to choose between that and answering other things, because I kind of want everyone to like answer this in addition. Um, and it's this this very way in which not only do ancient sacred traditions, as well as indigenous traditions that are still alive and practiced today, right, in many parts of the world, ways in which those get appropriated. And then I think more interestingly, perhaps commodified, right, yeah. so that it, they can be exploited in a capitalist system, right, and made profit off of. And so, um, you know, I think of companies like Goop, Right. And a lot of uh, these groups that use methods um, or even techniques or tools from sacred religious traditions, very often from the East, right, or again, um, more uh, indigenized groups. And there's a really interesting reason for why women flock to these new age sorts of treatments. And it has actually a legitimate foundation in a historical critique of the um, uh, traditional venues of medicine and science, right? Having historically been exclusionary towards women, right? And treating women's claims of pain in particular as either symptoms of the mind, right? So you should study the origins of, the, of hysteria, right? Um, I feel like they're, they've done some good documentaries about this recently, but um, it's just interesting to note that, you know, a lot of people flock to these types of view or uh, venues that end up seeing very, you know, problematic, but they do so perhaps with very good reason and intent. Um, so you end up seeing a lot of people who are trying to be more inclusive, right, maybe less Anglo-Saxon, and what they end up doing is just paying money to some corporation, right, who is merely manufacturing and uh, a not a non-authentic or not um, respectful to, you know, the origins of the tradition, I think, is maybe what some of you are pointing out in these cases. Uh, yeah, so there, there's a lot to be said there, but I just wanted to add that layer to it um, for our consideration uh, that you that goes through the history of all of these different views of treating women. And this is where we get our views of knowledge, right? I don't even think it's unique to New Age religious traditions, because mm. there are groups that are going to be commodifying and exploiting, right? Capitalistically speaking, anyways. Um, every set of religious beliefs, right? You see it in all the major world traditions as well. I mean, if any of you have ever had the, um, the interesting experience of going to the Vatican, right? You're both sort of like filled with this paradox of awe, you know, at the, at the beauty of the architecture and also like the utter hypocrisy of wealth, right? You know, housed in this one location um, for a tradition that is, you know, supposedly founded on the idea that the meek inherit the earth, you know, sort of idea. And you go into the gift, shop, right, just surround, it's all about selling all the little trinkets and, you know, it's just money making everywhere. It's all about uh, that. So again, I just, I don't think that's unique to okay. new age traditions. And so because it's not unique, um, it makes it seem like that commodification maybe is not tied to a hierarchical system, right? That maybe that those problems exist even in non-hierarchical, like what we're seeing now with the gig economy, right? Even when you have a lot of individualized, disaggregated parties making decisions, right? That we still, because, because of the capitalist system we're in, we're still gonna get that commodification. I trade off of becoming mainstream, right? All right, if we're gonna commodify it, because then we're gonna have more of a presence, right? More visibility, more acceptance into the realm of social norms, right? Less viewed as the other um, in the way in which, you know, a lot of these marginalized groups often are. And so it's hard to, to allow for one without the other, given the nature of the world we find ourselves in. I just want to 
as the instructor, just want to highlight a couple of wonderful philosophical themes that are going on here. Um, the last of which is the fact that, yes, right, there is this important discussion that, you know, we didn't have too much in this class, but it sort of underpins maybe a lot of what you guys are thinking, which is, you know, to what extent does morality and religion necessarily go hand in hand together, right? And so, obviously, right, people who practice religious traditions tend to fall under a particular what we call normative ethical framework, and I can type that in the chat <clears throat> just to give you guys that terminology. This might be familiar to some of you if any of you picked a moral topic for your argument, right? You would have had to dive into some of these theories, but um, the one that tends to capture most religious perspectives is known as divine command theory. And I have some information about this on my website if you guys are interested in, in it more. Um, but the idea here is that right or wrong comes from or is in line with God's will, right? But it's important to know that this is one of many, many ways of conceiving of what makes something right or wrong, right? So it is by no means the only way of conceiving morality, right? And so there are also potentially a lot of problems with this. Um, so the other thing that I wanted to note was um, the point you made about the differences between uh, women's motivations for veiling, right? And perhaps men's motivations or uh, desires or whatever motivates their opinions even, right? Um, since they're not like literally, I don't think putting, <laughs> I hope not. Um, so this I think might have more to do with um, this, feeling amongst many Muslims, uh, which is motivated by the idea to maintain the authenticity again of the tradition, right? So this goes along with the ideas of not translating the Quran, right, into any other language, right, for fear that it might lose some of its meaning. So again, the the sincerity with which many believers, to, right, take in maintaining the, the authenticity of the tradition puts it at odds with what um, many call westernization, right? So this way in which Western social norms and especially aesthetic beauty norms, right? Coming back around to our to our conversation, right? That this is like something people need to be protected against, right? And so in that anti-Western spirit, right? Anti-Westernization spirit, Right. There might be, again, a pushback like, well, yeah, we don't need all, you know, women don't need all these different colors and different options and, you know, fast fashion for their hijabs. Right. For all of the reasons that like there are legitimate criticisms right there to be made about the ways in which we socialize women. Right. To, um, you know, feel like they need to spend more on their looks, on their appearance, on their fashion. Right. Like, why do women have to have you know, different pairs of shoes to match every outfit. Men don't have to do that, right? Like, um, why do women have to, you know, take the burden of buying most makeup products, right? It's scary, something like uh, women spend about the equivalent in one year um, on makeup, what it would cost them to go to college, like the cost of tuition is what most people spend on. Like, it's crazy, right? So we have, and then I'm sure you've heard of the pink tax, right? There are like all these social norms in which we, we put this burden on women and it has a financial or a capitalist implication, right? And so there are a lot of important criticisms of that system, right? But we want to be careful again about this like anti-East, anti-West sort of dichotomy um, and unpack it for what it is. So yeah, there are just, there are a number of really important things going on um, that have sort of larger or foundational philosophical discussions that I think need to be hashed out before we can figure out like exactly where the problem is. But yeah, these are really good. I was remembering one of the shows, it's a little cheesy here and there, but have you seen uh, Mr. Selfridge? They do a great job of showing the beginning of the history of the um, the mall. And this time, uh, it's around the time of the suffrage movement in the UK. And uh, they, or no, I think, sorry, it's, they move from the UK to the US, I think. I can't remember if they're in the UK or the US. The, UA, the UK got the women's vote before we did, just FYI. <laughs> um, but so it's in, it's in one of those places, but um, they go through the origins of makeup and uh, like generalized fashion because fashion used to be something you bought like 
for each person. Like everything was tailored. They didn't have these like generic sizes that they would guess, you know, and mass produce. Um, and makeup was viewed as something that only prostitutes used, right, at first. And so it was seen as something that like, we don't even want to put this out in our stores and we don't even want to make it obvious that we sell it. Right. And so, yeah, it's important to note these social that they are social norms. Right. And we know that they're social norms because they've changed over time. Right. If they were innate in us somehow, they would always be consistent. Right. Humans would always feel the same way about these things. But because we've seen these evolutions over time, fashion is a great example. Right. Again, yeah, like Darwin pointed out, we're seeing it now crossing uh, gender lines, right, which is wonderful in, in all kinds of really interesting and fascinating ways, right? Um, but yeah, there still is that maybe concern of potential exploitation, right? Certain groups like, oh, if I get a shirt that says, you know, feminism or I'm an ally, right? Like, you know, or does that count? Like hashtag activism. <laughs> so, you know, we have to like be you careful. Can, you, you it's can... a different problem in that I buy cheap clothes, but that just means that they're made in another part of the world by, you know, exploit exploited labor, right? <laughs> labor practices and yeah, all of that stuff. So it's it's really hard in this day and age not to participate in something that is morally problematic. I think the good place got that right. Um, but there is an interesting split I'm seeing between younger generations. I'm not I'm so much older than you, but um, like more anti-materialism, which is nice because uh, I think, you know, I'm I'm a technically a millennial, right? So I think my generation has a little bit of that from it just in response to our parents' generation, but I think younger generations are getting it more. And I I hope that continues to be the trend. Uh to, you know, maybe we don't all have to have the white pit, you know, huge fence and the two point whatever kids and you know, the car many cars and a TV in every house and you know, the new phone every year, like all these things that other people tell you are what make for a good life. Like, I think people are realizing that that is not, <laughs> that has nothing to do with happiness. <laughs> um, and in fact, sometimes our pursuit of those things can get in the way of our happiness. Yeah, Darwin, there's some wonderful things that I want to highlight uh, in what you just said, one of which um, I just shared a link in the chat to a page on my website where I collect um, sort of like the media that I've shared with you guys every week, you know, in our Canvas course, but this is for a class that I don't get to teach anymore, so I put it on my website. Um, and it's a class called Science, Technology, and Value, right? And it's about this interplay, you know, between this sort of paradox we encounter with technology, which is that it has this immense benefit, right, net benefit to our lives and to the progression of humanity in the sense that we are able to connect and share information at rates that we have never been able to before. And the growth is exponential, right? Like just the how fast we have moved is really, really amazing. Um, but there's a flip side to this, right? And this is why I think it's named after Greek mythology, the Janus face of technology, right? There's this positive side, but there's also a negative side, right? And I think I don't have to go into too much. I think you guys are well aware of the negative side of technology and the potential uh, for harm they're in, right? And so how do we navigate, right? And we have to be very, very conscientious and intentional right, with the things that we partake in, right, whether it be our capitalist, <laughs> right, inclinations or not, um, but also, right, the jobs that we end up taking, right, what and what work we end up doing, um, and how that our values are going to permeate that work, right, or how our work may come to odds with the values that we hold and what to do when those situations arise. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention Oh, come back to me. Oh, uh, religious diversity. Uh, so Darwin, this was the other point that you made about just, you know, I think it's connected to the point about having lots of information, but just the plethora of religious traditions, right? And the willingness to accept that people are going to have different religious views, right? This is actually in and of itself a philosophical problem um, that it, it's faced. It's called as the problem of religious diversity, and it's how to handle your own religious beliefs, like how to think about your own religious beliefs, if you accept that other religious beliefs are 
equally plausible, right? And so there's some epistemic work we have to do there. And there's some really interesting arguments that argue that if you really are committed to your faith, then it's only rational to think that any religious beliefs that contradict yours are false, right? Like it would be inconsistent to hold them both to be true. So there's some, again, some some work that needs to be done in figuring that out. Um, I have a PowerPoint or, and I think I might've, I'm trying to make resources like this stuff available. So I, I can share my PowerPoint with you guys on religious diversity if you'd like. I don't think I've shared it yet. Um, but yeah, so some other really interesting philosophical themes, Dar Darwin, great, thank you me and it's why I, I study epistemology like knowledge and belief are that's like that's where my interest is and uh it is so fascinating to see how given that we have more information available than ever before we do seem to be more polarized than ever but like there's there are fewer people in the middle in terms of the way we see each other right but in reality, I think most of us are in the middle, right? <laughs> Very few people are at the extremes, which goes to, you know, who is documenting history, right? And how they're they're representing things, right? And what their motives are. Um, but then there, it reminds me just back to the beginning of the quarter, the Ninian Smart paper, what those two various ways of talking about dimensions of religion, you know, one of which you can know better than a lot of believers, <laughs> <laughs> right? In certain respects, you can know more about their own tradition than they do. Um, I've definitely, you know, had fellow religious studies people, you know, get into it with like Jehovah's Witnesses and, you know, people, like, because they, or, uh, you know, Mormon missionaries, like whoever comes to the door and is proselytizing, like, because they don't often know all the details of their own religion. And so it ends up being like a little history lesson for them. Um, but it it, it is interesting given how seriously people take their religious beliefs, sometimes how little they're willing to uh, explore more deeply its history. Men wanting to give up, right, or forsake their association with masculinity for anything feminine, that is absolutely a threat, right, to the existing hierarchy, to the status quo, but continue. I think it's much more. Well, that's the thing is that not only are there individuals who are targeting certain groups right now, but they're trying to make it so that future generations cannot fight against this oppression because they don't learn about it in school. Exactly. Right? Like we literally have the same individuals who are trying to ban drag shows, right? And ban healthcare for trans youth, right? And things like this are the same ones who are trying to make it so that you cannot teach about critical race theory or white supremacy in schools, right? So they're trying to whitewash and it's not rainbow wash. It's whatever the opposite, more whitewashing. It's uh, the opposite uh, of a rainbow. Uh, uh, nothing washing, scale? right? Uh, sanitizing. They're trying to sanitize, right? Our history, uh, you know, for the sake of the children, right? <laughs> but it's, it's not it's the first the, time they've done this. Straight washing. There we go. Yeah. No, no, this is... That's what's important. And this is why, you know, philosophers like Descartes are still so heavily, you know, referenced in philosophy because he was saying everything we have been taught, right, is not true because everything we have been taught comes from institutions where certain individuals who had power were trying to maintain that power, right? And I mean, so they're going to be teaching people whatever will keep them subservient, right, or in the role you want them to be in. Good. And this has to do, I think there's a I quote think, or a phrase, I forget who it comes from, but it's the idea that history is written for winners and losers, right? And it's written by the winners, not the losers, right? So it's always going to be framing whatever that historical narrative is in the context of that sort of, uh, it's, there's always this like duality, right? Same thing that we're seeing in the way that women are viewed. It's like we get, we're given one of two options, right? This extreme like overly idealistic the thing that's, you know, again, not attainable. And so we're always being judged for not being there. But then anytime you would try to assert your, your own autonomy, it's the evil, you know, most worst sin that you could do. And, you know, just I reaffirms everything that's negative about your femininity, right? Like those are the only two options that we seem to be given. 
right? And there there does seem to be an extra effort to try to protect, right? Um, especially people of color, right? The few that have made it into the history books, right? <laughs> but we also, yeah, we don't want to do the same sort of wa washing of history, right? Sanitization, uh, reconstructivist history, right? Um, we we need to embrace and learn from right the flaws of these figures and philosophy you know has a lot to say about this because obviously it's dominated historically by a certain type of privileged white male and that has permeated all of the theories right and so there's a question of you know should we even still be teaching these guys right but obviously the feminist criticism is of course <laughs> right you can't deal with the problem by not learning about it or ignoring it right so yes we have to we have to study it's why we have to read right the communist manifesto and hitler's writing and you know it's why we have to you know force ourselves to come in contact with those of views which we find reprehensible so that we are sure that they are wrong, right? <laughs> or that they should be rejected and we have to have good reason for doing so. Um, and of course, you all know the line about those who don't know their history are doomed to repeat it. Uh, that seems to absolutely be the case. And I don't know about you, but our memory seems to be really short. <laughs> Like, like people just forget where we were a year or two ago and how we got there, but yeah, a few more minutes left. So I want to give uh, those of you who maybe haven't had a chance to talk today um, a chance to share any last lingering questions or thoughts you have. Uh, I know a couple of you came in later. So just a reminder, this is our last class for the quarter. Too much pressure with the last class of the quarter bit. <laughs> well, I completely agree. And just to be honest with you guys, we're sort of struggling right now at uh, the community college level because our student demographics are obviously individuals who are more likely to have families and jobs and other commitments and things going on, um, right? A lot of part-time students go to community college. And so uh, we're struggling returning to campus or like I said earlier, even getting these hybrid sessions to go because mm -hmm. um, students, even though they know that it's better for that, they're just not able or un, you know unwilling at this time to make that uh, commitment. And I get it. Like, you know, I had to commute to campus at 6 a.m. and was there until three or four in the afternoon for what, two hours of class? Like, that's a huge commitment. And, you know, I am privileged enough to have a car and, <laughs> right, uh, you know, maybe have even a not as long commute as most people. And so I, I totally get it. But it's, it's hard when, you know, like this class almost didn't run because of how low enrolled it, it was at the beginning of the quarter. And um, so next quarter, they have all my classes scheduled for just asynchronous online. I'm going to try to set up like some voluntary stuff like this uh, for students so that I can have some of this element. Um, but those classes enrolled right away. So I don't know what to do. <laughs> it's like, do you risk a class getting canceled to try to, you know, make it a better experience for everyone? Or do you just do the thing that goes? Um, so I hear you, Darwin, tell your friends, <laughs> tell your friends to sign up for classes that have a hybrid component. <laughs> well, thank you again, you guys. Again, this has been just the highlight of the last three years of teaching for me. So if uh, I hope I get to see you guys uh, maybe again in another class. Um, I do have my teaching schedule up on my website. Um, if you're interested in taking the gender studies class with me next quarter, you might be interested in getting the gender studies concentration because you will be like at least halfway there, if not more, <laughs> after these two classes. Um, also, uh, the philosophy concentration, if you're interested in taking one of the other philosophy classes. So uh, keep those things on your radar. Um, or just if you want to reach out or have any questions about something philosophical, or related to gender <laughs> in your futures, or uh, if you're looking for someone to uh, talk to as you're getting ready to transfer or go on the job market, whatever it is, um, I'm happy to uh, to keep up. And I love hearing what you guys are up to as things go on. So I hope to see you guys again.